Well, greetings, everybody. My name is Jake McKenzie. I'm the president and CEO here at Enermark. And with me, as always, is Dr. David Bridwell, our chief people scientist and uh, with his background in behavioral psychology. If you have followed a lot of our other content we put out, we cover a lot of research and the psychology implications from that. In our webinar series, we like to get practical. How do you improve your own marketing? And today we're going to do a deep dive into memory science. Um, and if we're fair about it, it's really the science of forgetting more than the science of remembering because the brain initially takes in a lot of information. And remembering is a funny thing. Uh, we're all familiar with it. One of my favorite stories is about uh, Frederick Chopin sat down for one of uh, a piano performance uh, where he was going to play one of his sonatas, a piece that he had played literally thousands of times. And he put his fingers on the keyboard and he paused and he looked at the audience and he said, I'm so sorry, I don't remember the song. And we're all familiar with that concept of something we know we know. Like when you walk into the other room and you get there and you're like, why did I come in this room? And only later you're like, oh yeah, I went to get my keys or whatever the thing was. The brain's a funny thing. We're both great at remembering. I can remember things from my childhood and terrible at remembering. I couldn't tell you what I had for lunch two days ago. And these lessons have tremendous implications for how we approach marketing. And what we're going to find is that most marketers are not very good about applying the lessons from memory science. And we want to give you some practical applications to get better at your own marketing in terms of making you more memorable and thus more actionable. As we think about uh, covering off in the beginning and in Intermark, as you know, we are the nation's largest psychology driven marketing uh, firm. Um, where we apply the behavioral sciences to get better outcomes. We are privileged to work with some of the best brands across America, helping them achieve some outsized results. And we do that by um, helping them be better at marketing. So we do all of the things under the marketing sun, social media content, web development, TV, radio, print, outdoor, all of the normal things you would expect to be in advertising and marketing, including social media and public relations. And we have a team here in Birmingham. We also have offices in Tampa and Atlanta um, and expanding rapidly. So let's start with the very simple and provocative notion. Most ads get forgotten. And most might not even be a strong enough word here, David. Yeah, it's very frightening. It's very, uh, it's, it definitely gets my ears perked up. So when we look at that notion, we also want to take a look at what that means and then what can we learn from memory? And there are a number of lessons we want to walk away with today of how we can improve marketing that you may be putting out into the space. Um, and memory science gives us a ton of those. Now, we're gonna try to cover a couple of decades worth of research in a one hour time period. So we're gonna boil these down into what I think are digestible nuggets, but each of those nuggets is going to be uh, very large. Yeah, so we've uh, looked at the studies, the research that has shown that we often don't remember ads. So what this comes down to is that you're watching TV, some commercial comes on in the middle of your show. Now imagine a researcher calls you 24 hours later and asks you, do you remember that ad? Well, the look on people's faces when they get asked this question is often a lot of confusion, a lot of thinking back, and gee, I'm not sure, because it's actually pretty difficult to remember the ads. So when we look at the data here, you can imagine that this is the full array of commercials that people see. Now, how many of these actually get remembered when they do that call? Turns out only 40% of the ads get remembered, and that's vague aspects of the ads that can be remembered, like a little brief thing that they saw, pieces like that, and 60% aren't remembered at all. Some of that 40% is the, I can remember the joke, but I can't remember the company piece, or I can remember the dog, but I don't know who it was for or what they were selling. When we look at the actual percentage of people that remember the full ad and who it was for, it gets to be a shockingly small percentage. Yeah, only 40% among those 40% remember that the, the brand behind the ad. So it comes down to only 16%. Um, we're leaving a lot of potential waste or a lot of room for growth and a lot of room for uh, maximizing your effort and spend if you can learn about memory and apply memory science to your advertising. You know, that 16% is a terrifying number. If I am a business and thinking about putting messages out into the marketplace and I'm like, wait, only 16% of people are going to remember my ad and my company from that? Now, it doesn't mean that marketing doesn't work. Marketing clearly works. Even bad marketing works, and we've talked about that before. But the point here is you can be dramatically more effective, and you want to be in that 
So what can we learn from memory science to be in that 16%, to make our ads so memorable that people recognize them, remember them, and then act on them? Yeah, and it starts with the understanding of consumer behavior. So how do we go about the world and how do we engage with the way that we buy products and think about brands? When we really understand that, that's what can allow us to be effective in how we approach our marketing. And the first important piece of research comes from Nielsen, where they show a single brand is typically only bought once or twice a year. And next, there's often a substantial period of time between seeing an advertisement and making a purchase. So this is really where the understanding of memory comes in, right? Because as Jake mentioned, it's really about forgetting. And memory is the, the brain's process of keeping that information in mind between the moment where we learn about something and we see the ad and the moment where we can go about and actually make that purchase. And that means people's ability to remember your ad becomes uh, huge here because Otherwise, it requires you to be in front of somebody just prior to them getting in market, which is a very expensive proposition for most folks. So we've got to get good at making ads memorable. Now, this first piece of data about people only buying your brand once or twice a year, we've covered before, but it is worth mentioning again. A lot of companies fall into the trap of focusing on their high use consumers, the folks who are doing, doing business with you 15 plus times, because those are the people you see on a regular basis. But that's not where our growth comes from. Statistically, I don't care what you sell, it comes from many people buying from you in an infrequent basis. Now, what this means practically are two things. One, we need to go for reach. We need to talk to lots of people and not just our best consumers. Retention marketing is typically one of the least effective things that you can do. But second, we need to make our ads more memorable so that when we are reaching lots of people, we can affect the mass because that's how we are going to grow. Now, I can already hear several of you over the internet saying, wait, 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 my business is different. It doesn't look like this chart. And I'm here to tell you, yes, it does. Every single industry we've looked at, service, product, otherwise, B2B, B2C, they all look uh, some flavor of this. Yeah, and the reason why is because this is a reflection of human behavior. It's a reflection of the way our memory works. And that, of course, manifests as we go about our lives with all of the brands and the companies and that we engage in. So if you look at chocolate bars and you plot the number of purchases and the number of people making the purchase, you can see those big tall bars on the left show a very large number of people purchasing a very few amount of the product. And each of those colors is a different company. So what that means is that it's consistent across companies. The biggest company, the smallest company, this distribution stays intact. If you look at detergents, it's generally the same pattern where there's a heavy amount of people who are light buyers and then it tails off towards those who purchase a large amount of the product. And again, it's consistent across the different detergent companies, irrespective of the size of the company. That's right. And you can see the folks with the really strong brands do a little bit better and move a little bit further to the right, but it's not a whole lot. So we've got to drive retention and we've got to do reach. We've got to talk to a mass audience on a regular basis and make our ads memorable. And that's the big takeaway uh, from this data. So where do we go from here? Well, when we think about shopping, shopping is really about nudging people. Now, we're never going to get 100% market share, and we're never going to get 100% market share because people come in with existing behaviors and pre-existing thinking. And our job is to slightly change those odds. And so think about it in terms of probability. And I love this construct you've come up with, David. Yeah, so you might imagine there's a 75% probability of picking one and a 25% of picking another product on the, that you see on the shelves. And that means that we don't have certainty in what we choose, but that those probabilities can change based on what the information that we receive. So if we see an ad, then we might shift that probability up slightly to buying that one that we saw the advertisement for and reduce the probability for the one that we didn't see the ad for. But the point, as Jake mentioned, is this is a nudge. This is an incremental impact, and it's important to stay in front and be there to keep this percentage high and keep that nudge going. Well, the purchase factors in too, because this relates to the commitment principle, which we love talking about at Intermark Group. If you bought the product and you've used the product, then your probability again is going to slightly increase for the one and it's going to slightly decrease for the other. With most companies that we work with, you're 
customers have bought from somebody prior. They have an existing relationship and we're trying to change that relationship. So we're trying to overcome some large psychological heuristics some things that are in place that keep behavior difficult to change. Now, we're likely familiar with some of those heuristics. Um, for instance, one of the drivers that we're trying to overcome is loss aversion. So if you've done business with somebody before, you're thinking, hey, I know what that experience was like. And unless it was a terrible experience, you're worried about the next experience being worse. So loss aversion kicks in and we're trying to overcome this. The second driver is the commitment principle. Once you make a decision, your brain rewires itself to think, wow, that was a really brilliant decision. Thus, we're trying to overcome these two drivers. And that's why advertising should be thinking about nudging behavior rather than just overwhelming behavior. And this is why when you run campaigns, you get incremental growth and why longevity and consistency needs to be part of our message because you're slowly moving a market. Otherwise, we'd all run one big campaign, we'd be done, and that would be the end of it. But unfortunately, we have fade and other people are in the market trying to nudge that behavior as well. Thus being more memorable can be a major component of helping you achieve that incremental growth. Yeah, and thinking back again to understanding the customer, we understand that memories are stored in the hippocampus. So when they are thinking about the brand and when they're storing memories about the brand, it's involving these brain areas that process that advertisement, the sensory areas, vision, auditory, sometimes even tactile, sometimes ol olfactory. And then that works with the hippocampus to store it in long-term memory. And we're battling against maintaining that storage and maintaining those associations and creating those associations with our ads. Now, what I want you to take away from this is not the difference between the amygdala and the hippocampus. We'll cover off on a lot of that for you, but rather the brain stores memories in lots of different ways, depending on how you get that memory. Now, that's going to be particularly insightful because the more ways that we can trigger the brain to try to store that information, the more likely they are to remember it. So that's going to be a major takeaway here. And we're going to see that sprinkled throughout the rest of the research and practical applications, which is great because we're pretty terrible at remembering. Yeah, this is the forgetting curve from memory science. And you can see it's depicting the for how much we forget something that we learn as time progresses. So in red there, you can see you learn about it. And as days go by, there's a quick decline in how much you remember. The key thing here, that's the first key thing is that we forget. The second key thing is that when we, when we learn about the item a second time, shown in that green bar, then the decay is not as quick. So we actually have a reinforcement and we have more memory for that item that maintains. And as we learn about it again, that memory maintains even more. So a major lesson here is frequency. It's not sufficient to get an ad in front of someone one time, but rather we want some repetition. And you are likely familiar with this. On Super Bowl Monday, when somebody says, hey, what was your favorite ad from yesterday? You might remember one or two, but you're really gonna struggle to remember many more than that because you need repetition. And then after a year passes, it's much easier to remember the Super Bowl ads as advertisers have put lots of money behind them and you've seen them many times. Thus, frequency becomes a major driver of memory. Yeah, and we understand the importance of staying present to, to maintain in memory, in marketing. The data is there that shows how powerful that could be. And once we lose that frequency, we tend to fade from people's minds. And we see this in longitudinal data. So when companies stop spending entirely, sometimes because of an economic shock, like because of COVID, we find there are long-term implications for their market share and their growth it's hard to recover from this. So once you go dark, you will slide backwards and it will take you a long time to recover because remember, it's this incremental process of growth. It's not a rocket ship that goes straight up. Thus, frequency is not only important for the initial remembering, but continuing to have that frequency for keeping that memory intact so that it becomes actionable. Yeah, the second most important piece to consider about from memory sciences is that we only remember a few items at once. That is to say, when we're holding information in our minds at a time, there's only a few pieces that we can keep in mind. So if our memory was perfect, the more information in our memory would go hand in hand in a straight line. You could see in this plot, as it reaches a certain amount of information, it starts to flatline. And that has big implications for the messaging that we try to communicate and how we try to compare products and think about multiple products at the same time. Yeah, and it also has to do with the amount of information that we try to convey. And we're gonna talk about this quite a bit more. Um, we try to jam too much stuff into ads. We simply can't do it because the brain will remember one thing well 
and many more than that, as you're going to see, becomes poor performance. So yeah, this is where Jake likes to talk about the law of least effort. We, we like the easiest, simplest solution that arrives for us. That's right. And if you've heard me much, you know I'm going to talk about the law of least effort. Um, because what it says is that we're looking for simple answers to complex questions. You want to stop thinking about things. And giving a simple answer to that complex question is a great way to help store in memory, but also become actionable. So our job is to stay present so that we stay in consideration because we don't really shop for everything at one time. We're not evaluating all possible options. You're probably familiar with this. If you've gone and ever shopped for something that has a lot of options like beer, you don't really shop all those options. You look for a small subset and you're trying to decide between that. Yeah, and really that's the way to think about the benefits of the advertising is that it might not necessarily be about purchase my one product. It might be about think about my product among a con consideration set because realistically we have these consideration sets. We have a small amount of products that we often switch between and that we are loyal to that small group of products. And really the goal is to get within that consideration set. This is how I look at beer at the beer aisle. Man, look at that red my lips beer. That's looking pretty good right now. I was wondering about that because uh, I don't recognize any of these, but I am familiar with the concept because it doesn't matter what you're shopping for. You start with a subset that is dependent on your memory of things you're willing to consider. Cars are the same way. You don't really evaluate the you know, 50 odd uh, makes that are out there. Rather, you might think I'm gonna shop for a Ford, a Toyota or a Nissan. And that's your consideration. Those get in your consideration set purely from the advocacy in your memory. And that's where this becomes important. Your first challenge is to make that consideration set. Now, you may be thinking this doesn't work like this in my business, but it absolutely does. We want to make the consideration set because consumers are not evaluating all possibilities within this group, but rather a subset of that, depending on how they have gotten to that point of the selection process. And this also applies in the B, to, uh, B space just as well as B to C. So all the principles we're going to talk about today work in both of those areas because this has to do with how we remember and how we process information, not specific to any one industry. So your memory is related to getting on that consideration set and then emerging from that consideration set as the winner of who we want to do business with, the product or service that we want to purchase. So. What are the lessons here that we can learn from memory? And we're gonna cover these in more depth. Uh, number one is be recognizable and distinct. Number two is to create mental associations. Number three is using mnemonics and other memory devices such as narrative structure to make our content more memorable. And the last is engagement. Now, each of these is going to be a very broad category with lots of components within it. You will likely have questions about some of this. So when you have questions, go over to the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and put your question in. We're gonna have plenty of time for questions at the end and we'd love to cover off on some of these because we're gonna cover a lot of ground. But let's start with the first one, being recognizable and distinct, standing out from your competitors because the brain does not like to remember things that it thinks are the same. And this is the first major um, mistake, if you will, of marketers is not finding ways to make yourself distinguishable. I don't just mean in terms of, hey, we got to stick our logo on screen, right, David? Yeah, it's more complicated than that, as, as we'll talk about. But basically, this comes down to recognizing that it's you. Clearly, that's one of the most important factors that needs to be involved as the first step of engaging with your customer. And it actually maps onto memory science really well. When we think about the two different types of memory, implicit memory and explicit memory. The strong role of just recognizing that the brand exists and is there plays really strongly into the notion of implicit memory, which is how we learn about a lot of things in the environment. And it's a major influence in our behavior and how we go about the world. Now, an easy way to think about implicit versus explicit memory, implicit memory is, hey, I know that thing. Explicit memory is being able to verbalize it. That's when we know something so well that we can translate it into language and describe about it. So you may see the gecko and immediately go, oh, I know that thing. But the explicit memory would be able to tell me something about the gecko. And getting to that slogan of 15 uh, minutes will save you 15%. Yeah, and implicit memory is the larger majority of how we process information in the environment. And we've come to this conclusion in the world of marketing separately on our own in noticing that in this study, which looked at over 5,000 advertisements from the EFI Awards from Mark Ritson, 
these factors from one through 10, coming in at number three was codes, which is the same as saying distinctive brand assets or the same as saying brand assets or brand elements. We mean the same thing. It is those unique qualities that visually and instantly make you recognizable to people. That's how powerful they are. How do you stand out? And that's a really great way of thinking about this. And there are a lot of components of this and it is not merely a logo or even a tagline, but lots of subcomponents. Now, KFC does an exceptional job of having lots of brand elements that they've defined their brand around. So it's not just the term KFC or even finger licking good, but they have the distinctive red, the buckets, the kernel, the bow tie, his white suit, and many other elements. And you see this in their marketing as they work to expand those elements to expand the mental space that they own. Now, as soon as you see someone that looks vaguely like a colonel, you immediately think, hey, that's KFC. To the point now, if someone wears a white suit, chances are you're gonna give them a KFC joke because they've defined that as a brand element. And what we find is that these brand elements, these codes to use a memory science uh, mnemonic are unbelievably effective. Yeah, I can't believe I forgot to wear my white suit today. <laughs> I have to dust it off. Now, if I could sit in a, in a meeting of the strategy behind this advertisement from the company perspective or the brand perspective, it's clear that the goal of this commercial for Major Mellon that appeared on the Super Bowl was to build these distinctive brand assets. You can see them everywhere in this ad. So let's take a look and see how that goes. First account and tweet the exact number of Mountain Dew Major Melon bottles shown in this commercial, and you could win a million dollars. You know, I'd love to go through this ad with more time and point out all the different memory devices they are leveraging, all the codes that they are putting in here, because there are a lot of them, everything from celebrities to colors and audio and lots of product and logos but it may be easier to cover off on some of the ones that are particularly effective. Yeah, this is looking at the likelihood of remembering branded, of branded attention. And what happens is that when you use these more complicated elements, like the colors and these more subtle things that get in that implicit memory, you have much more effective branded attention shown on the right than if you just use the mention of the company name or the company logo. And we see that a lot. We see companies that have something funny, then at the very end, they're like, oh, by the way, here we are. And they forget to integrate those elements throughout the spot. So we've got a great example here where there are lots of those branded elements that you can see that bake into lead to strong recall. This is from our friends at Physicians Mutual. If Physicians Mutual were a friend of yours, we'd be like Eddie here, loyal, dependable, and always there for you. We'd be the one you'd talk to about retirement, the complexities of Medicare, and the coverage you'd need. We'd listen and give you straightforward answers. Mm. Think of us as your devoted retirement friend. Mm. At Physicians Mutual, we'll help you find the coverage you need so you can have the retirement you deserve. Oh, good boy. Physicians Mutual, Physicians Mutual. Lots of codes baked into this spot. Audio mnemonics, visual, they have a celebrity, they've got um, a character uh, with Eddie the dog, brand mentions, um, strong recall. And as we look at what is particularly effective, we see that there are certain things that are dramatically more effective. The ones that are visual, such as characters and celebrities, we already know can be particularly effective because they help us with our, our own memory structures. And you look at the very bottom of that list, it's logos. And that's the one that clients are always concerned about getting on screen, even though it is one of the least effective ways to help trigger long-term memory. Another piece that often gets overlooked are those sonic cues, the audio mnemonics. Uh, the jingles, if you will, and things that you can brand around that are the highest ranked way to trigger memory. Because remember, this goes back to the brain stores information in lots of different ways, and we want to trigger as many of those as possible to increase the likelihood that they do remember. And what we find is that advertisers in general are really poor about using these devices within their marketing. 
Now, they're really good about using logos, which was the least effective thing, and they become less effective at the particularly effective things. With only 6% of companies using sonic, sonic branded cues. Now, that helps explain why only 16% of ads get regular recall. And it's because we're not baking in a lot of the core elements, the codes that are particularly effective at allowing us to remember the ad. Yeah, and we talked about why this is so important from the company perspective and the brand perspective. But when we look at the customer and the audience, what this does is it helps us build trust and familiarity. And that's one of the most powerful psychological principles that you need to consider in your marketing. It has such a big impact compared to the others. So we know that when you repeatedly see the same item, you start to develop positive uh, feelings and associations for that item just from seeing it repeatedly. That's actually a fascinating psychological observation about what, how we are as people processing the world. And again, it comes down to the familiarity principle. And this is really an evolutionary piece. You know, think caveman sort of days. If we were exposed to something and it didn't hurt us, well, it must be good. And thus we created affinity for it. Now we think about it psychologically as the mere exposure effect. The more we see something and are exposed to it, the more we like that thing. And it gets to the point of familiarity where we actually have strong affinity for that thing. And branding and memory can help us get to that point. And as we'll see, it can have a particular effect in how we create mental associations, which is point number two. Now, mental associations are context clues intended to spur us to remember a certain thing. Now, you don't walk around thinking, hey, I'm going to buy some insurance and I'm thinking about insurance. No, nope, that's not the way the world works. So strong marketing helps define the times where we want to be remembered. What are those specific circumstances where I want you to have strong recall for my brand or my message? And this is great because it reflects how our memory actually works. Our memory is shaped by our perception and experience. It is contextual. We remember certain things at certain times and understanding and uh, that one piece of information can make your marketing dramatically more effective. Yeah, this is an interesting finding from Kantar and Miller Brown, Miller Brown, where if you, it turns out if you ask people, what's the first airline that comes to mind? Now, this is a British audience, and so they're saying British Airways. Now, if you ask people of a quality low-cost airline, they don't say British Airlines. They say EasyJet. So you can see that the way they arrive at the decision and how they think about it actually changes the class of brands that they think about. And you can see that one of these approaches might be more impactful and you might have a strategy for going after one versus the other. Maybe people don't say, hey, let me just think of the first airline that pops to mind, but they think, you know, I want something that's gonna be quality and low cost to get me where I wanna go. And we're all familiar with that construct. You're traveling personally, you wanna get the family somewhere, all of a sudden it's not just what airline am I familiar with, but how do I get them all where I'm going, the cheapest that's still high quality. Thus, they've defined a very specific context in which they want to be remembered, and that is part of the brand architecture. And that's important to build within your marketing. Define when we want people to remember this specific information, and that will help define how you structure the content. Yeah, and this sheds a little light on, you know, we shared the fact that people typically only buy a brand one or two times per year. It's because we experience many different contexts throughout the day. And, you know, I know one that's very prominent for me is that when I'm by the sea, you need to eat seafood. It just tastes better. More delicious. I eat shrimp when I hit the coast, man. And we have context for that that shapes our memory and perception. And so building into that context is particularly effective. And we all have these. David, you've got one when you fly, right? Yeah, when I'm flying, that's the time when I drink ginger ale. So the, the two times a year when I drink ginger ale is when I'm flying. Just, I don't really know why, but that that's what I do. That's what you're supposed to do when you fly. <laughs> My kids do the same thing. It's great contextually. So understanding more about where your consumers are coming from ought to be baked into your marketing understanding what they're thinking and how they make decisions. And we do this with lots of products. And I know you're a beer aficionado. Yeah, I thought we went too long without talking about beer again. So here's an example. If you're going to visit a friend, you might consider this batch. If it's a Friday night at home, you might consider this batch. And what I have to remind myself is when I'm at that restaurant and I ask for a beer menu 
and I'm expecting them to, you know, list off IPAs or some local beer, and then they start listing off Miller Lite and Bud Light. I try not to embarrass myself and uh, go with the Bud Light. Well, I am glad that COVID restrictions are lifting so that we can hang out because I was not familiar with any of those beers that you were drinking, and I feel like I'm uh, a step behind. But the important piece here is that context, understanding the place and time somebody ought to remember something and then structuring your marketing around that. And this begins with understanding your consumer. And we can uh, easily recall very familiar ads that have done an exceptional job of defining those contexts and building it into the marketing itself. Our friends from Milk built one of the most iconic ads from the last couple of decades that I know you're familiar with. And that was the Vienna Wood Dancing D, one of my all-time favorites. And now let's make that random call with today's $10,000 question. It's a tough one. Who shot Alexander Hamilton in that famous duel? All right, let's go to the phones and see who's out there. Hello? Hello, for $10,000, who shot... Hello, Excuse me? Hello, I'm afraid your time is almost up. I'm sorry, maybe next time. Got milk. So the context here is obvious. They define the context. You can't have a peanut butter sandwich. You can't have cookies without milk. And by defining the context, it triggers specific recall for people which is a great way of leaning into memory science. This was a, such a great insight, which is that when you're at the grocery store, you don't say, oh my gosh, I'm thirsty. Let me go get some milk. Milk is something that you want when you have that thing that you really want, which is the cookie. So you don't remember to buy it at the store. And so now they're creating a situation so that you can have that association. So when you're at the store, you can be reminded of it and you could buy it. Every time you pick up peanut butter or cookies, you think, aha, I got to go get some milk. Brilliant move by the folks at Milk, but we've seen lots of other companies do this to great effect. Like take our friends at Coca-Cola, for instance, they have done a spectacular job of defining very specific associations and lots of them related to Coke. We think of having a Coke when we're rewarding ourselves, when we're sitting down for a family meal at a special time, sometimes just with a hot dog or even pizza strongly associated with Coke. But we also have it in other contexts of it's really hot outside, I need to cool off and have something refreshing. So lots of different associations they've built, which leads to market share. And as you will see, creating number of associations is how you build market share. Now this doesn't happen quickly. It took Apple a really long time to build lots of associations, but you can see the net effect as they become the most valuable company on the planet. And the folks who only have one or two associations are the weakest and smallest. So that you can see the power of defining the context and the associations with which we want to have with specific brands, product, or services. The more we can have and define, which takes money, which takes time, the more successful we'll be long term. Yeah, and the point is that you shouldn't go out and try to create a dozen different associations in your next year-long advertising campaign. You have to de develop them and work them over time. And again, this relates to our memory in that we can only remember a few key pieces of information at one time. We have a decay. So you need to think about the associations that you want to create. And what this finding shows is that if you have the goal of communicating one message, 100% of the people will remember that message. But if you introduce a second message, 65% of them will remember the first message now and another 65% will report that they remember the second one. So your memory for that item has declined and split uh, across people based on two and three and four messages. And it gets dramatically worse. And the upshot here is you need to stick to a single message within your marketing. So building these contexts takes time and effort across campaigns. And that's where the larger companies with bigger budgets win, but you can get there by being definitive within your own marketing to make it more successful. And it starts with this concept of simple distinction. Know who you are and how you differentiate for your competition and hammer away at that one thing. Now, getting it down to one thing is really tough. Uh, our friends at Troy University did an exceptional job. You think about 
um, shopping for uh, a college and you think, holy cow, talk about a complex selection process. People might evaluate hundreds of variables, but we know from the law of least effort that they do not. They're looking for simple answers to complex questions. One thing. At Troy, they realized that their one thing could be about leadership education, which they have practical ways of actually integrating to their curriculum. So a recent campaign from our team helped them to use some of this memory science to create a very compelling effort to get this across. We all dream. We dream when we're sleeping, when we're awake. But dreams quickly become distant memories unless we do something about it. Push ourselves. Believe in something. Do everything in our power. Direct every action and thought we have to learn to lead, to make it real. At Troy University, we offer leadership opportunities from day one. We're dedicated to teaching a new generation to lead change. Do you have what it takes to change the world? It's a great example of simple distinction, hammering away at one thing. And most marketing across all marketing platforms needs to continue to hammer away at one thing because it's tough to get things into memory. And you can see lots of other memory science pieces within this spot and the other spots that we're showing in efforts to try to get to that point of recall, which leads us to point number three. There's lots of memory science out there, everything from mnemonics to narrative structures and highly emotional advertising that we can learn from and use to engage in our ads. Tricks to make things more uh, memorable. You probably remember some mnemonics from your uh, education days, trying to trick us into remembering things. There are lots of these devices, including the use of characters to make complicated subjects more palatable. That passion fruit popsicle is becoming a puddle pee up. Oh, need to pay fast. Good thing St. George now have Apple Pay. It's fast, easy, and seriously awesome. And you can use it until you're red in the face. Sorry. Which means? Which means you can pay with your Apple Watch pee up. Oh. Great. Can I have a lick? <laughs> Thank you. Awesome news. St. George now has Apple Pay. So we use mnemonics to help remember complex pieces of information. A complex piece of information we don't usually even want to hear, let alone store. So using these tricks will help us remember it. So things like a dragon, um, to deliver complex financial information, using alliteration to help it be more memorable about what it was that we wanted to remember are particularly effective. We can use these similar devices to convey other complex information. So for instance, say you've got a website that is a mouthful that you want to get across. Well, you can repeat it ad nauseum and hope they remember it and it will be somewhat effective. However, you can give them a mnemonic that will make it much easier to remember. Do this with visuals, a storytelling or highly emotional ads. This is a tremendous example of helping to remember not meerkats, but markets. I am Alexander, founder of CompareTheMeerkat.com, where we compare meerkats. Size hobbies, you know, but lately we get many people looking for car insurance. People looking for CompareTheMarket.com. I cannot find you cheap car insurance. For Compare Meerkats, come to CompareTheMeerkat.com. For easy way to save on car insurance, please go to CompareTheMarket.com. Simples. Now, if I were to ask you tomorrow what the web address is for CompareTheMarket.com, the likelihood that you will remember will go up significantly because we've given you a mnemonic to do that, a meerkat. It has a story narrative within it, and it's uh, mildly amusing. Thus, we're tricking your brain in known ways to remember things. And this leads us to another mnemonic that we can use, which is a narrative structure, particularly if it is emotional. We can convey complex information by telling a story. Our brain's hardwired for stories, and we remember those much better than raw information. So if I want you to remember that we have an app and there, there are lots of hospitals across the state, I could tell you that, or I can tell you a story where it becomes relevant to a, a customer, and thus it becomes particularly memorable, as we see in this example. 
Meet Joe. He's from Huntsville. He and his buddies are laughing now, but earlier, Joe broke his wrist in a fishing accident off the Alabama Gulf. Fortunately, he's got Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Alabama. Our Alabama Blue app found the closest hospital. And as the state's most preferred health insurer, we're accepted at 99% of Alabama hospitals, from Lake Gunnersville to Mobile Bay. That's comforting to Joe, considering the state he's in today. Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Alabama. We cover what matters. Find out how we can cover you on the go. I love it. Great narrative structure, strong emotional tie. I know you were aware that building emotion into your ads helps with memory structure, and it's because we store it in a different way. And things that are highly emotional get priority in terms of storing. Things that we consider boring, we often don't spend the mental resource to do it. So using these mnemonics are critical for helping people remember your content. Yeah, and you'll notice in these examples that we showed, you know, we looked at the insurance space, we looked at financial space, healthcare. These are all very high information categories. And it turns out that emotion and these uh, approaches are even more effective in these high thought about categories like insurance and finance. And, and emotion is super critical. So we actually can't make any decisions at all without using our emotional system. This is the famous research by Antonio Damasio. He showed that if the area of your brain that processes that makes you feel emotions is gone, is gone away, you can rationalize things all day, but you can never take that in, in rationalization and make a decision with it because you don't have that emotional system. So it's critical to get that. And it reflects what we've talked about a whole lot, that system one makes emotional decisions and then we rationalize them after the fact. So not only does it help with memory storage, it helps with decision making. So great mnemonic to lean into. The last one we talk about is the principle of engagement. Now we've talked a lot about that we don't like to think, but if I can get you to think like we have done for the last hour, the likelihood that you will remember something increases dramatically. Yeah, and this comes from the memory research and the depth of processing model. Basically, the more meaning and engagement that you have at the time of encoding, when you're learning about something, the more stronger the long-term memory for that item will be. And we saw this with the major melon. What they actually did is they made it a part of the ad where they wanted you to count all of the bottles that showed up and you went $1 million or so if you could count how many bottles appeared. And so lots of people watched the ads in slow motion and counting them. They were tricking them into engaging with the ad, which dramatically increased recall and affinity. You can do this even more simply. This is an ad that we did for St. Vincent's, a health system uh, here in the Deep South. It's one of the Ascension uh, networks. And this is an ad for mammograms. Now, mammograms are one of those topics you may not want to think much about. So we built some engagement into it. The headline here says mammograms catches things you missed. And you see this very artistically designed mammogram in the background and it makes you wonder what's going on there. So you lean in a little bit. You ask yourself, wait a minute, what's going on here? And you begin to scan the ad. You're using your system too and aha, I spot something that shouldn't be there. Mammograms catch something you miss. Now your recall for that message will be increased, but most importantly, St. Vincent's will get increased recall as well as affinity. Tricking us into thinking via engagement dramatically increases the likelihood that we're going to remember and have affinity for that thing. It's a great memory device to get us to remember. So, Recap from today, number one, most ads are forgotten and the data there is pretty dramatic. There's a lot that we can learn from memory science and we have covered a whole lot of ground today. Number one, be recognizable and distinct. Apply those codes religiously so that your brand has a broad definition and isn't reliant just on your logo. Number two, create mental associations. Define specifically when and where do we want people to remember our information so that we have triggers to help us remember. Three, Use mnemonics such as narrative structure, emotional marketing, um, storytelling, visuals, et cetera, to help us remember. And then lastly, we can create engagement moments which we trick people into thinking, which increases our focus on recall. Now, most of the ads you'll notice use some of these techniques. It is really hard to design something that uses all of these. And that's ultimately what you're trying to do is to be prescriptive. Think about the devices you want to use and put them into the brief before it gets to the creative process. And that's how you make your marketing dramatically more effective. Don't just leave it up to people who have never stuttered memory science to see if they come up with a good idea and hopefully they'll touch off on one of these. Let's be intentional. Now, 
We've got lots of time here at the end for questions. So please uh, put your questions into the Q&A or the chat feature and we'll be happy to answer a few. If you like this content and wanna see some more of it, of course, we'll have this at our website. We will send out the full video as well as the um, deck will be available from our website. You'll get an email uh, reminding you of that. If you have questions you wanna dig into deeper, send me an email. I would love to nerd out with you and talk about how this can apply to your business or your brand or just answer your questions because clearly we enjoy talking about uh, particularly the data or the sciences behind all of this and making your marketing more effective. So let's pivot here and we'll take a few questions with our time remaining. Um, the first question comes from Colleen and she wants to know, uh, how do you use some of these ideas in the direct mail and digital channels? And how do we uh, address some ideas that might work? So great question, Colleen, and we get variations of this. We often show brand spots in our uh, examples because they're ones that everybody's familiar with. But to Colleen's point, these are particularly effective in all spaces. So if we want people to remember things in direct response and digital ads, particularly, we've got to use these same devices. Now, as David pointed out, most marketers don't. They fail to use these devices. And it's because particularly in the digital and direct response spaces, we're at the such of the low part of the funnel, we're only looking at the next day activities. Did somebody click on this? And we stop thinking about how does it affect people long-term? But these will increase the likelihood of branded activities, but also increase the likelihood of subsequent engagement in future iterations of digital ads, as well as direct response. So I'd still apply all of these same lessons because all marketing is brand marketing even if you're in the job of direct response, because it will affect future iterations of those direct response or those digital ads. Got a question here about segmentation. Um, if a company has to go for reach and the ad needs to be built for a specific segment, or does it have to be built taking everyone into consideration? So great question. Now, the way we design ads, you wanna start by defining a sub audience that you want to be particularly effective against. And let's begin by understanding that audience. But within that, you want to get as much reach as possible. Now, we usually counter reach um, to caution people against over-targeting, of only talking to a subset of audience, but rather trying to talk to as broad of an audience as possible. But targeting within that will make your uh, ads more effective. The counter to this we often hear are people wanting to focus on uh, retention, uh, as an example, or just a small subset. And we try to remind people that your subset is a construct to help you design your ads, but should not be the sole governing factor in, in where you communicate. Because you will sell products and services to a much broader uh, spectrum of people than you will ever encounter. So it's a balancing act between where do we place the ads and how do we construct the ads. So the brief should inform both, but your uh, ad spend piece of the eyeballs we're trying to get in front of people ought to be a little bit broader than that. You ought to try to get in front of as many people as you possibly can and err on the side of reach even over frequency because we know from long-term business driver that's where success happens. Yeah, we didn't have time to talk about the foundational research of Field and Binet, but they have discussed a lot about the long and short and the notion that there's two different objectives that you need to strategically set one is building brand specifically for building brand and then harvesting the building of the brand in an activational piece where you're more focused on sales. And that's where you kind of might think differently about the segments that you might more strategically focus on when you're going in on that activation and that sales, maybe a little bit more of a rational perspective within that audience. It's a good comment here uh, from a copywriter. Pete notes how much you would love to write for original characters. So I'm glad you walk away from this going, holy cow, original characters are particularly effective because they are. Um, but it's also a very empowering for creative groups because it gives them fertile ground in which to be creative, knowing that it's going to be particularly effective. They can find their own voice, which becomes a brand element, which becomes a code that then we can apply religiously to get uh, more effects. So I, mean, I love to see people picking up on these elements and immediately personalizing them. Another question, um, I love this from uh, uh, Andrea, does memory operate differently by generation? I get variations on this question a lot as I speak, um, and the short answer is no, um, it does not. We have memory structures that are the same for the rest of our lives. Now, how we perceive memory does change over the course of our lifetime. Our memory does get mildly worse as we age, that's not a surprise. However, we become increasingly concerned about our memory at a disproportionate level as we age. 
well out of proportion to our failures of memory. And the way this works is when you forget something and you're 21, you're like, eh, whatever, it happens. When you forget something and you are 51, you're like, oh my goodness, is my memory going? Because we have this whole social construct of forgetting and you begin to worry about dementia and Alzheimer's and other things that you just don't worry about when you're 21. So we have a tendency to believe that memory gets even worse than it really does as we age, but the same constructs, the mnemonics, the uh, heuristics of how we remember and how we store things in memory are exactly the same when we are uh, 12 years old as when we are 62 years old. So no matter the segment that you are applying to, take these same lessons and apply. What would you add to that, David? There's a really interesting marketing perspective on that, which is if you think about the case of Coca-Cola, say in the 60s, if they had a message that they wanted to communicate, then they could run a TV commercial. The majority of their audience is going to see that same TV commercial. Maybe they've got a print ad and a billboard. But it's much easier back in those days where you had that linear TV and you could communicate that single message. Think about how split up the customers are today in terms of seeing different messages from the same brand and the implications of that for the mental associations that the customers are going to have and how that goes into all the debate that we have about digital marketing and all of that. Well, it's very complicated and I don't necessarily have an answer for you, but it, it's very interesting to think about the implications for that for today. Um, they are, there's a lot here um, and it's tough to cover decades worth of research and apply it to all the different places in a one hour. So as you have questions about applying it into your business, smaller places. I love talking about this in digital because it is often very forgotten because it's such a low piece of the funnel that you can make your marketing dramatically more effective by applying the sciences. And that ought to be the, the big takeaway. Well, I wanna thank everybody for attending today. As I said, you will get an email tomorrow after you attend with links to the show as well as the ability to download the deck. Send me an email with your questions and we will see you at a webinar next quarter. Uh, be on the lookout for our CMO Minute, where we are putting out a weekly piece of content. If you're not getting that, go to our website and sign up for the newsletter, and we will see you next time. David, thank you for everything. This has been a whole lot of fun, and thanks to everybody for attending.